Good morning, everyone. My name is Kamran Habib, and I'm a senior solutions architect at Amazon Web Services, Australia and New Zealand, based in Melbourne. Thank you for joining the AWS Data and Analytics virtual series. In the spirit of reconciliation, Amazon Web Services acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend their respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Over the next few weeks, we will be showcasing how businesses in Australia and New Zealand are using data as a strategic asset to offer better products and customer experiences, make better business decisions, and find efficiencies to reduce costs. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Kmart Australia and AWS partner DS as we showcase learn how they collaborated with AWS to unlock powerful analytics and insights to support Kmart's global retail expansion. We, also, we will also have Q&A start panel style discussion with all the speakers and give you the opportunity to ask our panel questions. Today's event will run for 45 minutes and we'll allow some additional time for Q&A. All participants will be on mute to ensure that the session runs smoothly, but you will be able to type questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar panel. Our experts can answer your questions during the Q&A sessions. Our speakers today are Anirban Chatterjee, product owner, online fulfillment at Kmart, Nicholas Potesta, lead engineer, Kmart, Pooja Arora, iteration manager at Kmart, and Eric Danielson, lead engineer at DS. Hi all, I'm Anirban Chatterjee. Currently, I'm the product owner in the online fulfillment squad within Kmart Digital. And uh, previous to this, I was uh, the product owner in Nanko or the Kmart Global. Hey guys, I'm hey. Nicholas Petita. I'm the uh, technical lead for uh, at Kmart Digital. I'm previously the tech lead at uh, Anko. Pooja. Hey everyone, I'm Pooja Rora. I'm currently working as an iteration manager with Kmart. Uh, previous to this, I was working as a senior business analyst with Anchor or Kmart Global. Hi guys, my name is Eric. I'm a senior consultant at Pierce and a bit of a jack of all trades. Thank you, everybody. Before we start though today, we will launch a poll questions to the audience just to get some insights from our audience today. Thank you. We will kick off with Anirban, who will start with Kmart's vision for entering new markets. Anirban, over to you. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, first, a big thank you to all our audience for joining the webinar and giving me and my colleagues from Anco and Deus an opportunity to share our Anco experience and learnings. It was such a memorable journey. Uh, to be honest, when four of us were discussing about this, it brought back so many memories. And now, don't get me wrong, uh, there were days which were a bit meh, a bit challenging, but most of the experience we still cherish. Let me begin with a little bit of a background about Anko. Uh, many of you may remember that Kmart used to have four different Anko brands, namely Kids & Co, Active & Co, Home & Co, and Clothing & Co. When we moved from sourcing goods made by others to designing our trendy everyday products, we decided to transition to one product brand, which was Anko. Now, uh, when we thought, when Kmart thought that we will be moving to uh, international market expand and test the brand name was a simple choice since uh, we are not allowed to use the brand came out outside ANZ. And here is the fun part, though Anko is not an acronym, but someone internally came up with the phrase a new kind of and then three dots. And honestly, it almost felt like a license to fill up those three little dots with any ideas. 
And that was the essence of ANCO, ideate, experiment, test, and learn. Uh, to be very honest, uh, having a bit of a long rope is always not fun. We really didn't know which of the ideas require prioritization. But after a few quick experiments, test and learn cycle, we found the top three hypotheses what we wanted to experiment. Now remember, just three dots, so just three hypotheses. We nailed it, kind of. Uh, okay, the first one was easy. We knew that we have these great products loved by customers in both Australia and New Zealand. But the question was, is there a market outside this region? And how do we make them resonant? So at the very first, we wanted to validate a, on creating a compelling customer value proposition, which will drive a viral word of mouth and connected customer experience across digital and physical. Now, the second one was to figure out a new retail model for scale and profitability. And to be very specific, we wanted to create a store network for the digital age using a supply chain that can flow a wide range of products in small volumes. And now that's the important thing because Kmart generally uh, flow big volumes and Anko was, in Anko we try to do just the opposite. And also supply chain which has a short lead time and most important doing all this by keeping end-to-end -end cost low. And we wanted to achieve this using near technology and operational innovation. And the thought process was that if we can validate the first two, the third one was to figure out a path to rapid expansion. Now, uh, what to validate the very first hypothesis, what we did was to test out a wholesale model where we partnered with established retailer in Southeast Asia and supplied them our anchor range of products on demand. We started in Thailand around late 2017. And by mid 2018, we entered Indonesia as well as Papua New Guinea. And around late 2018, we had our first retail pop-up store in the US. Both the wholesale and retail operations helped us to test our first hypothesis around CVP. Once we were confident that we have a market, we moved on to try the next idea about a new retail format. And by early 2019, we had our first retail store in the US. Now here comes the exciting and often surprising part, right? Anko was a startup within Kmart. We started from scratch and to be honest, we didn't know much about international, state, international trade. We were uh, still learning. We knew a few questions to ask when we started, like can we legally sell our products in this country? What are the trade requirements? Which image should we add uh, in the catalog? And most important, is this operating model profitable? But quickly realized that just these four or five questions were not enough. The questions just kept on coming. There were more to answer. And quickly, this multiple question snowballs from signal to absolute noise. And though it may sound like a bad news, and it was challenging at that point of time, we were like a little bit thinking what to do. But it actually proved to be the aha moment we were looking for. We realized there were too many questions, but not enough answers. And that's because our data was either missing or so fragmented that it was impossible to figure out what's going on. We realized we require a structure and smart way to manage our data and use them intelligently to make business decisions. That was good, but we also know that we have to move fast in a way that is quick, but scalable. It was not simple. The you know, the biggest challenge was our business model. Since it was so different than Kmart ANZ, it almost uh, ruled out using any Kmart system or data except the most basic ones like product, supply details, etc. So essentially, we were challenged to build a data platform and visualization across the entire ecosystem, almost from scratch in a very short time frame. And just to give you an idea, it's when I say the entire ecosystem, it means the from factories to the entire upper supply chain, inspection, testing, the downstream of the supply chain, all the way to our stores and website. Now, given we were a very small team, we couldn't do it all by ourselves. And that's why we partnered with Deus, who had the experience and expertise in data and cloud technologies to help us out. Now, uh, how we achieved it and what we learned is what my other colleagues from Kmart and Deus will cover in the next section. Thanks, over to you, Eric. Amazing, um, amazing work, uh, Arnevon. Thanks for those brilliant insights and amazing story. Uh, we will hand over to Eric from Dias. We'll provide some technical perspective into Kmart's transformation. Over to you, Eric. Thank you. Now, 
when we arrived at, so when Diaz arrived at Kmart, uh, we found that the business was already in flight. They'd proven out that the business model could work, and they had one retail partner in Thailand, as Animal mentioned. Um, but it was very manual what was going on. So there wasn't really much technology to support the business at this point. Uh, data was manually create, kept in a spreadsheet, as many businesses do. You know, everything starts with a spreadsheet. And, and they had to then keep different types of data, mostly product-related data, for different purposes in one big spreadsheet, as they called their database. Um, and then they would basically share this with many different parties. Say it could be uh, the customer for a catalog, it could be manufacturers to manufacture the products, and it would be customs and shipping partners to get the goods actually shipped. Uh, every time a new order was to be processed, it could take a couple of weeks to three weeks to just prepare the data for that order. It sounds crazy, but when you're talking about the number of products K1 actually has, which is in total, close to 100,000 different actual products. And the data that comes with all of that, it's not that strange, I guess. Okay, so the first thing we tried to do was to help out with the very operational aspects of the business at the time. We weren't really trying to do anything smart in the beginning, we just had to learn the business as well. So first thing was basically to try to reduce the lead time that it took to actually prepare the data, but also improve the correctness of the data we're working with because everything was put together manually and put in a spreadsheet. Um, and when I said the correctness of the data, just to get an idea of how important it actually is, like things that actually happened would be if the documentation that went to uh, customs, say in Thailand, and a, and a container ship was to arrive in a Bangkok harbor, was wrong. There was uh, something missing, or it might be the material description or product, what it's actually made from was wrong. Thai customs would hold it up and you weren't able to unload the ship, which would mean that the customer wouldn't get the products on time, and it's costly. So to deal with this, we got as many of the sources as was previously used to prepare the spreadsheet as possible into an S3 bucket, mostly in uh, CSV form, some in Excel, and then we applied some simple ETL to that. So we used a an, an, uh, SAS ETL tool, as well as some lambdas and some AWS tools there to sort of merge these sources together in an automated way and then split them again into multiple outputs so that different people could get the data they needed um, to at least try to reduce the amount of manual work happening and also to hopefully fix some of the issues that we mentioned that we had in the data, which we'll get to next. Now that had helped reduce the time it takes to prepare data for a given order, but we hadn't solved necessarily all the problems with the data correctness. And to do that, we need to be a bit smarter. So we realized we have to master the data as well. It's not enough to just say, so basically be a data pipe and take data from one source and then push it out to multiple outputs. Uh, we wanted to master it. We basically started building services or little applications that would take data from multiple sources. Most of them would still be CSV files and batch files, but some of them started becoming stream sources as well. So as Kmart were modernizing some of their own uh, source systems to produce data in form of events and, source and streams. And we would basically hook up SQS queues to each of these sources. Uh, it makes sound strange to use SQS queues for a batch source, where we basically build lambdas to split the files, the batch files, into individual records and then put them on queues. And our services would process them and store them in a relational database. Uh, and the way we did this, and specifically talking about our product service here, which is probably the most complicated one, was to store each input source in a separate table in a relational database. Uh, and then use rules in code to determine what data points to use from each of these sources. So say the same data points, so say the color of a product or the weight of a product or the materials in the product might exist in multiple sources, but one of them would be a better or a more reliable source than another. So we would codify this by basically saying, if it exists in source A, which might be the primary source, we'll take it from there, but if it's not there, we'll take it from source B and so on. So we did not necessarily store the result of that code. We would just uh, generate what we call an event from that and push that to an S3 bucket, which we can then fan out and, and let other services, other applications use downstream. Uh, the reason why we didn't want to necessarily store the output is that 
we this allowed us to make changes to the code, changes to the rules, redeploy it, and uh, sort of re-trigger a generation of all events or all yeah, all events again, and not having to worry about migrating the data or anything like that, because the data was basically uh, described in code. Uh, now, these services, and there were many of them, I just mentioned products, but we also had one for stock information, we had one for order information, we had one for pricing information. Uh, they were all sort of individual sources of truth for, uh, for data. And they were all made in the same way. So you'd basically take multiple inputs and generate a single or sometimes a couple of different outputs. And this allowed us to compose uh, more complicated systems. So for instance, if you want to build a forecasting application, we could take outputs from a order system and a, a stock system to gen have some uh, rules around what forecasting looks like to advise the customer on say when they need to order products to not have their shelves run empty. So they're very composable and as you can see they all look more or less the same. In addition to integrating with Kmart internal systems to answer some of the questions that come, um, that Anuban alluded to, we needed to integrate with external systems as well. So, for instance, to better advise and help our customers, we agreed with them, so they agreed with us to <clears throat> send us product data back after they changed things. Uh, they would send us their current stock levels, they would send sales data on a daily or weekly basis and they would upload that straight to S3 so we could treat that as an input source like any Kmart source. Uh, we just had to be a bit more careful with uh, with validating the data on the way in. And similarly we integrated with a logistics partner over a protocol called AS2. It's basically a bit like FTP, it's a, a file-based exchange protocol um we would send them information from our suppliers as i we, we've we requested manufacturing of a product that meant that they could uh, make space in a warehouse know that something is about to come and once a truck arrived with the goods they would send us an event back so basically a file back that specify what was in the truck uh, we could then send them commands to sort of start shipping this out and they would send us again uh events or files once they've shipped it so we know that it's on a ship then it's on its way to the destination. So we all treated this, this, um, these sources the same way. Now, at this point, we've only just started talking about moving data from one point to another. And in the beginning, that's mostly what we did. But to answer some of the more complicated questions that Anima mentioned, we needed to find a way to give custom or users internally mostly to explore this data and to answer some of their questions, right? Um, and we discussed a lot, how are we gonna build user interfaces? Like what kind of user interfaces do we need? Because we're really just building backend systems here. And we couldn't get to an answer because everybody needed something different. So instead of trying to build an interface that's gonna solve everybody's problem, we looked at alternative solutions. Our boss that came out at the time kept saying we need to liberate the data, that's the, that's the term she used. Uh, so I said, okay, okay, if you, if you think that'll work, if that's all it's going to take, then we'll try that. And so we looked into a, a service that Amazon has called Athena. Athena let you query data that sits in S3 via a SQL-like language. And we already had all our data in S3 because we happened to push our events, all our event information to S3. We had a batch file sitting in S3. Everything was basically there. So it seemed like a good fit and we gave it a go. And as it turned out, it was, it was a very good fit. Uh, but to query that, you need to understand the structure of the files that are sitting in S3. And for that, we used Clue Data Crawlers. That's another service from Amazon. It basically pointed at one of my buckets. It will go and read the files, detect the structure, find out what the data types are, how many rows there are, that sort of thing, and build up something that looks a little bit like a relational database table. We will tell you then what the names or the attributes or the columns available are, data types, that's so. all. Athena can use that, let's say, definition or metadata to query data from. So you can see from the arrows, Athena queries and reads the files in the buckets directly, but it, it reads the metadata or sort of the structure from the catalog. 
So that's actually detached the structure of, of the, the data from the schema, which means that you can actually delete the schema and build a new one without actually touching the data. It's quite powerful. Um, now, some users were very happy to query Athena directly because the results came back in CSV Excel form. They're very comfortable with that. They're used to doing that. Um, it's perfect for them. Others wanted to see visualizations. And we looked into a few different options here. So we were talking uh, talking to Click, we were talking to Looker, we looked at Tableau. But all of these tools, they take, they, they require a lot of investment, both time and money, because you need to pay a license fee and you need to train people to use it. So we also had a look at QuickSight, which is an Amazon tool. It's not maybe at quite at the same level and they're not trying to compete with these products, but it's a quick way to get started and there's no license involved. It's a pay-as-you-go model, so you can sort of just play with it and see if it'll suit, suit you. It did to an extent for us. We did have calls for the product team in uh, in the US to sort of understand the roadmap, and we, we, we decided to give it a go. So we, we built a visualization in there, and we should let you interact with the data. And we would also schedule reports in QuickSight, which would get emailed out to users on a regular basis. Um, and a combination of all of these ways of accessing the data turned out to be quite powerful and served most of our needs. And that's how it all started. And now Nick is going to talk a little bit about what's happened since. Amazing, Eric. Now over to Nick, who will provide some additional tech considerations. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Um, so. Um, after we were able to, uh, I guess, finally liberate the data, um, there was a lot of learnings that we took away from the development at Anko, um, especially those that we continue to harness while we build out solutions um, at Anko, but also building out some of our other next-gen solutions at Kmart. So a lot of these learnings are actually the basis for the tech principles that drive our group's development today. Um, so one thing we learned during our Anco journey was the importance of dumb pipes between services. So logic within these pipes generally complicates relationships between services um, as, and as such the data, um, which in further, you know, in turn further increases the complexity of our systems. So as Eric explored previously, you know, the output of one data source effectively becomes the input of another and, and nothing more. Um, as, as is evident throughout you know, the entire presentation, data is king around here. Um, and, and as such, any and all data that is required for a solution needs to be housed and mastered within the solution. Um, you know, we never want to rely on an external store um, or solutions to house and master the data that we need. Uh, so we always avoid implementing technical solutions that don't fit within um, our context. Um, and the, the major consideration here being the understanding of the current skill set of the technology that came up. So with this, it, it is worth mentioning a big driver in order to improve the, the general understanding of a lot of the core AWS tech within Kmart technology um, was an initiative to get 100% of our tech team AWS certified during the latter half of 2019. Um, we're actually successful in doing so as of uh, December 2019. So. This, this shared understanding and skill set means that we're actually able to continue to explore and leverage a lot of the cloud native tech being explored through um, these solutions in the presentation. Uh, and most importantly, always engineering for now. So we never want to generalize too early. Um, as, as demonstrated by Eric earlier, a lot of the needs, um, specifically around the data itself and, and, and even more so the presentation of the data, um, so a prime example of this is the discussions around the requirements for the proposed user interface for this data. Um, and, and what this means is, you know, more generally, flexibility means complexity, and we never wanted to sacrifice the simplicity of our solutions to allow for you know, flexibility. So I guess onto some of the more specifics of continuing to build out these solutions for scale. So we, we learned pretty quickly that Athena and QuickSight do tend to require and a lot more nuanced approach when working at larger scales, um, specifically with regard to how larger data sets are structured and partitioned. So as we continue to work with, with this tech at Kmart, we've learned it, it pays dividends to, to get these particular aspects of Athena and QuickSight set up right um, earlier rather than later, of course. So 
So with the alternative to being, you know, to begin to migrate towards tech that's more suited for these larger scales, so stuff like Redshift and Kinesis, um, depending heavily on the use case, of course. Uh, another aspect that that becomes uh, quickly becomes very important is is the is very well defined service boundaries, um, but specifically the, within the context of the data. So one thing that becomes quite apparent quite quickly is components that begin to to be built to accept many data inputs um, or, or sources with an aim to then build larger aggregated data sets create bottlenecks quite quickly. Um, so, so that well-defined data context um, and as such the, the service boundary does allow for the ability to continue to scale much quicker and, and much more easily. So um, an example obviously you know, is pushing aggregated data between services to, to allow for this. Um, as with the solutioning explored so far, so cloud native and serverless tech are always um, the preference when it comes to building these solutions. So the less infrastructure to worry about generally is better. Um, as long as the infrastructure is well designed, you know, let, let AWS worry about scaling it. Um, so, so this becomes very apparent via our heavy use of native S3, SNS, SQS fan out mechanism. So as we explored with Eric, they're, they're super powerful. Um, they, they scale quite well and they're super simple to set up. Um, so a, a big consideration at scale is the question around observability um, becoming more and more apparent. So we need to ensure that we're able to continue to answer these questions with our data at all times. So, so solving for this, we actually continue to utilize a lot of our tech learnings and principles to implement a very similar patent approach um, to increase the observability of our platform. So this includes the use of internal tooling such as you know, AWS X-Ray, but also, um, continuing on from my previous point, we, we heavily leverage native AWS fan out to provide observability data, um, just like any other piece of data as part of our platform um, to, to observability providers. So following on from the success of with our you know, sort of composable building blocks that, that we explored with Eric in the previous slides, we were able to begin deriving and delivering more and more complex business requirements via some relatively simple implementations at scale. So a lot of the outputs of these previous building blocks essentially become starting points to begin gluing and mastering aggregated data in newly composed sets of services. So as an example, one of the questions that arose later in the ANCO journey was, can we get all product data for an image of a product? Um, and to answer this question, we took we took our learnings and we applied it to our approach to, to building out a content management adapter system. So the aim of the solution was to provide an automated interface for data enriched content into um, the CMS system. Um, so this includes data tied to the multimedia asset provided in marketing content and photos. So as an aside, the, the diagram on the slide has been cut down a little bit for simplicity's sake, but what I'm hoping to illustrate is that we were able to very quickly answer these complex complex questions and realize value out of the data catalog by leveraging um, the product data via an existing approach to data fan out. So we began to fan out all of our product data into an Elasticsearch instance, which we could then utilize to pull out data on demand in a you know, perf pretty performant manner. So this then allowed for a completely automated data entry into our CMS with a user only really required to include known product identifiers included in the provided asset. So effectively our solution would create the asset alongside the required attributes. So this is data such as you know, product names, styles, colors, materials, all that sort of stuff, um, included and included a you know, generated thumbnail for, for higher res images. So we could then begin to leverage further metadata by ingesting this product data, these product data outputs and running provided stock images through something like Amazon recognition to then pull image metadata out and ingest it as appropriate. So we actually experimented with this, with including this um, in our CMS integration to, to answer some complex questions like, you know, is a particular image usable in certain markets due to licensing a model's likeness? So in this example, to answer this question, if recognition was able to recognize a human face, we could begin to automatically flag any images that might not be usable in certain markets. So another outcome of our ANCO learnings around continuing to build at scale um, is the ability to realize value from our platform faster. So the big takeaway here is 
Um, to allow our delivery practices to also scale with the solution. Um, it, it's not just a technology problem. So the first part of this is to ensure piecemeal delivery. Um, Pooja will explore this a little bit further with you guys uh, later on, but the major takeaway from a, from a technology standpoint, however, is it requires buy-in from the whole team, um, not just developers. Uh, and it's something that we, we continue to finesse at Kmart. So one of the ways we allow for the ability to deliver faster via a piecemeal approach is um, building out of our internal tools. So specifically through templated infrastructure and code, um, we learn quite quickly any time that a pattern emerges within an approach to delivery. Um, automating the generation of the template to begin with pays dividends a lot later. So it's important to allow time for this during the, the technical delivery of, of the solution. So some examples of this include, you know, generated sample services. So once templated, developers can actually generate boilerplate code and, and add remove what's needed on the fly. Um, and with that, new patterns for data delivery um, creates a, new, a basis for, for new templates. So the more patterns that are identified and covered, the faster developers can hit the ground running um, as these new services are required. Uh, another one is uh, generated infrastructure templates. So uh, de as developers sort of whiteboard technical solutions, pat patterns begin to emerge quite quickly um, and as explored throughout the, the previous slides. So these patterns begin to, to dictate how we template out our solutions further. Um, and, and as explored previously, you know, leveraging native fan out is very common. Um, it, within the group. So building out templates to allow for these common patterns means we can begin to deliver them, you know, again and again, faster and faster. Finally, templating the delivery of how we create new internal projects, so libraries and other components to further aid our solutions. So I guess an example of this in, in action is, um, involves how we surface the data to the appropriate people. Um, you know, bringing the data to the people. Um, so this involves specifically building out infrastructure and service code to, to push messages directly to groups via Slack. Um, so an example of this at Anko is, you know, as sales orders are raised by customers, we're actually able to package them up and simply push them out directly to users and teams via Slack. Um, by templating out the supporting infrastructure as well as the, the service patterns themselves, you know, utilizing this, this approach across data sets becomes easier um, and it, it, it's a lot faster than move that into production. So to, to sum up our, uh, to sum up from a technical perspective, a lot of the learnings that came out of the, the Anko journey kind of, you know, uh, are as follows. So ensuring the team sticks with what works while liberating the data appropriately. So these almost act as guardrails to ensure data is able to continue to be liberated. Um, the context of the data is very important at scale, so um, especially when considering service boundaries. So trying to aggregate too many data inputs in one place can get very, very messy. Uh, cloud native fan out is you know, super powerful, uh, super simple, scales really well. Um, and, and once those basic data building blocks are in place, um, this enables the ability to answer more and more complicated questions. So. Um, with that as well, identifying those patterns early. So not just from a tech point of view, um, this includes the, the delivery practices themselves. So th the important thing here is it requires buying from the whole team. It's, it's not the sole respons responsibility of one particular role. Uh, and most importantly, constantly sharpening um, the sword. So this involves ensuring we're always improving all of these approaches to delivery and our technical solutions. Um, we're never, you know, done, done when it comes to this stuff. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to pass things over to, to Pooja to explore a bit more of what this means from a business perspective. Thanks, Nick. Uh, now over to Pooja from Kmart, who will provide insights into Kmart's key learnings. Thanks, Tony and Nick. Um, in this part, uh, I will talk about learnings we have acquired from our Enco journey, hypothesis we have verified, and how we are using them currently in building next-gen solution in Kmart. So as Anirban mentioned earlier, when we started this journey, we had many unanswered questions and many hypotheses to verify. We also wanted to identify the right approach. Well, in short, we were not sure about the direction. So we started consuming data from multiple systems, which include product data, vendor data, 
supply chain lead time, cost of product, international trade, and the list continues. All this data was coming through various systems and wasn't even uniform. So the first and foremost step was to build single source of truth to make right decisions. And as explained by Eric and Nick in the text section, that we started consuming and skimming data to build an ecosystem that eventually became our backbone to expand into different countries. So that single source of truth enabled us to start a wholesale business in Asia, retail stores in US along with our e-commerce platform. It was only because of data we could identify optimum supply chain, product cost, and compliance. Talking about compliance, data empowered us to create an automated compliance solution, which generated compliance rating for different countries based on material, department, vendor, across all the products we wanted to range. Not only this, uh, we also wanted images along with product data to be used on our, e on our e com platform in the US. By figuring out the way to surface it, we identified that Kema doesn't have a repository to have controlled access to content. So we use CMS, which was a strategic enabler for personalization, providing real time access to approved images along with all other product data, which includes SKU, product name, color, style, family tree. As Nick described, since we mastered our data, we were able to auto tag all this information pretty smoothly, including a generated thumbnail for our high res images. By doing all this, we were able to validate our first hypothesis, which, were, which was to create a compelling customer value proposition, which drives a viral word of mouth and creating a connected customer experience across digital and physical. But the cherry on the cake was CMS being absorbed by Kmart and all our digital assets now flow directly from studios auto labeled with all product specific info, which helped in saving approximately 800 hours of effort for much team and also generating additional 40% content at the same cost. We have done experiment with visual search as well and data plus cloud enabled us to have a swift and accurate response which we may leverage later on KMR digital platforms. The second high priority hypothesis was to test a new, new retail model for scalability and profitability. Data along with cloud aided us to establish wholesale and retail business internationally. The next thing we wanted to verify was a different retail model. So we experimented with small store format retail stores in US. Basically, it is a smaller footprint store with a curated range focused to a specific demography, which use hub and spoke model for fulfillment. Smaller store format is more cost effective because um, rent is low and focused range reduces the chances of markdown clearance. Limited range doesn't stop customer from buying online, but presented products in a more attractive way. We took away that learning from Anko and opened a couple of K-Hub stores in Victoria recently. So the confluence of data and cloud enabled us to validate our assumptions in an impactable manner. But it wouldn't have been possible without our ways of working principles. And Nick also touched upon this. The first and foremost learning we derived from Anko and which we are still following in Kmart is about loose coupling. We needed data from multiple system and in real time. Hence, we pioneered with microservice-based architecture within Kmart. The idea was to chop any business problem smaller, build iteratively and deliver value continuously which ties back to a couple of things mentioned in tech solution. That is, do not over-engineer, focus on current problem or build for now, and never generalize too early. I can say the essence was to keep it simple. And the last one, but my favorite one was fail early, fail often. And I cannot emphasize more on sticking to this principle because it keeps us focused by minimizing waste and pivoting quickly. The intention was to maximize the work not done, 
and prioritize ruthlessly to realize value faster. And now before passing it on, I would like to thank you all of you for joining this webinar. It was great to share our experience and learnings with you. Kamran, over to you. Thank you, Pooja. Awesome stuff. So, uh, so the work DS did at Kmart is a great example of leveraging an event-driven architecture approach to help businesses get the data where it needs it most. Uh, our partner DS would like to offer a two-hour discover workshop with your product team to find out how this can help you. Um, I'll give a moment for you to uh, take the QR code. Also, the URL for this workshop to book it is ds.tech slash offer. Before we start our Q&A. Uh, we, we do have a we do have quite a few questions, so we will not be also accepting questions from participants as well. Um, if uh, if people have noted down, I'll I'll start asking the first question. So um, so first question to uh, Anirban, I would say Anirban or Eric. I'll, uh, so the questioner asked, I was just wondering if off the shelf inventory sales operational management systems were considered in addition to the build from scratch solution. If yes, what were some of the drivers for the team to build the solution from the ground up? Yeah, so definitely we did explore a few of these SaaS products out there in the market. But uh, like I said, there we were a startup, so our uh, resources or the you know the budget was limited, so, and we didn't want to do, invest straight away on and and you know get into a license agreement agreement with someone we did use a few of the SaaS products like we use salsify and another thing called appian uh but for most of for the rest of the thing it was like we wanted to try it ourselves because we were not sure if it you know what we were looking for okay thank you Anabar. uh next question is for eric what did you mean by data described in code yeah, so it's more about the rules, I guess. Um, instead of having a database schema that describes the structure of the data, we would do the same, but uh, say it is described in a DD, uh, DSL, so a domain-specific language, um, which I almost have to show an example of to really explain, but we're, ex we're describing the structure as we're pushing it up, as we're say, say if you want to generate in most of the cases we're generating JSON data, and we're just describing the structure of the JSON payload in code as we're pushing it out as an event. We don't necessarily store it. So if we find that we need to change some of the rules we're using to to generate that JSON, we would just uh, update the code and just push it again. New structure. This goes to history. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next question for Nick. How does Kmart security team, team look for insights into this brave cloud world? Um, yeah, good question. So um, they're actually very, very supportive um, of, of the, the, the journey into the cloud. Um, but also um, the, the, the driver to get everyone certified was also a big help there in, in terms of getting them um, sort of self-motivating and getting them also involved. Um, so they, they almost sort of, you know, answer a lot of those questions themselves. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they took quite well to it because I think they understood that we could leverage a lot of um, the, the, those cloud technologies to, to, you know, do what we need to do um, in a way that was quite easy to, to support in production. All right, thank you. Uh, Pooja, Pooja, a question for you. Is there a roadmap to connect customer consumer data with the product data? Oh, well, um, once we started, there were a lot of roadmaps, to be honest. But yes, as we um, go on with our journey, we kind of connected dots, those dots to create our roadmap. All right, uh, some more technical questions. Uh, I'll ask Eric based on your presentation. Could you elaborate on the Docker-based service in relation to the pro data processing that it provided? Yeah, so the first it was quite simple. It's just listening to multiple queues. Uh, each queue basically is an input source and it would take whatever's coming in on that to uh, store in a table, separate table. And then anytime any of those sources would change, we would, uh, as previously mentioned, we would basically 
query all of the tables and then in rules in code specify what to pick from each of these sources to generate a new output. So any input from any or any change from any of the inputs would generate a new event on the way out basically. Um, the services weren't typically very complicated. They were literally describing which source to use for what type of information. We did have some that were a little bit more complicated. For instance, there were codified rules for um, what we need in order to sell the product in a particular market. So the, the, the needs in Thailand and the needs in Indonesia and the US are different because customs are looking for different information. So we've had that codified in, so for instance, say, unless we have all the information, say that we know the material is not going to be bamboo, for instance, um, then if, if it is bamboo, we know we're not going to sell it in Thailand, uh, as an example. We, we had some of that in codified as well, so we sort of give them a rating. If we can't sell this in the US, we can. We can't sell this in Thailand, we can. Um, that's basically what the services did. They didn't typically have a lot of, a lot of terms of APIs. So they were mostly data in, data out um, type applications. Okay. Uh, uh, next question for Nick. Uh, could you elaborate on the issues you experienced regarding data partitioning in Athena? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, basically, w once your data sets get quite large, um, specifically when you're working with Athena, um, it, it, it's very much like an RDMS. It, 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 you, you need to start thinking about how to actually partition that data, um, given that it, it operates in a similar way. Effectively, once you, you almost hit this sort of point of diminishing returns where you've got to start to think about, well, how do I need to begin to partition these, these you know, almost flat files, if you will, um, to be able to query them um, in, a, in a more performant manner. Um, much like Eric alluded to in his slide, it, it effectively it reads the data out of um, the bucket um, with, with the, the structure coming from, from Glue in our particular implementation. Um, where, where that sort of partitioning comes into it is when, again, you, you, you hit a certain scale, I guess, where you've got a large amount of data, um, whether it's in a single file or multiple files, that you're now sort of parsing. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's setting up that, that partitioning earlier is, is what starts to, to pay, pay dividends. Um, I think Eric's got a follow up too. Yeah, so in some cases it's, it's quite easy to do that partitioning, especially if the data can somehow be split into time. Uh, so for instance, if you have sales data or anything that is temporal in nature, so you sort of can split it into months, or years, months, days, that sort of thing. What what um, Athena lets you do then is in your where clause specify, say it's for this year, this month, this day, and it will only look at the data that it sits in a folder that matches that that, that time period. But in other types of data, like it's product information, uh, it's not easy to partition it because they could a product in our case had more than a hundred different attributes, and you never know what the user is going to query on. So there's no easy way of partitioning it. It really does depend on on the nature of the data. All right, thank you both, um, Eric, and I, I would say this is for both Eric and Nick. With external integrations, did you face challenges, pushbacks? And how did you assuage the partners about risks, IP and sharing val valuable retail data? And along the same lines, how do you ensure privacy and security of customers, data privacy and security of customers? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first question they all asked was, where's your FTP server? That was pretty much all of them. Uh, and this was before Amazon supported FTP for S3. So this was a bit earlier than that, in hindsight. It would have probably been quicker for us to build an FTP server, to be perfectly honest, because it took them a while sometimes to, to do it. None of them said we're not going to do it. And maybe this is a cultural thing, I don't know. But none of them said we won't do it. It just took a very long time sometimes to get them uh, to get the data uploaded. We split it in such a way that each third party had its own bucket and they only had permissions to write and read. They didn't have permissions to delete and they couldn't see each other's data. So that we'd control that with roles. Um, so they, they weren't basically, there was no danger there, I don't think, but yes, uh, it was painful to get them to do it. And in now, at least if I was going to do it again, I'd probably use the FTP for S3 function straight away. Okay. And uh, I think Nick, for you, how, how do you ensure data privacy and security of customers from a Kmart perspective? Yeah, yeah. So um, as, as you probably saw in a lot of the sort of boxes with arrows, a lot of our approach to passing data is, is sort of that tell, don't ask approach. Um, and obviously, you know, the first step there is encrypt, 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 where appropriate, of course. Um, and a lot of the, the, the serverless messaging supports that, which, which is great. 
Um, but in terms of then, you know, once with that that tell don't ask approach where you're pushing, you know, data between services, um, if say a downstream service doesn't actually need that 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 um, data, um, you know, so we, we, we start to look at things like, well, maybe we provide a, a, an output or a boundary on that service that doesn't include that, that data. I mean, if it's not needed, don't share it, right? Um, but the, 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 the approach was, you know, as soon as it was private, you know, stuff that we need to be careful with, um, you know, encrypt, 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 um, and, and only, I guess, you know, store and, and pass around what's actually needed uh, is, is, was, was, you know, to sum it up. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we could rabbit hole pretty quickly in terms of what we were doing to, to protect um, um, privacy. Uh, Nick, I'll, I'll keep you on. There's another question for you. Could you highlight how data reprocessing and recovery steps are performed? Example, did you have a partial ingestion and how did you treat such data processing issues, especially when using SNS as a trigger? Yeah, good good question. Um, the, the way, so uh, you, you would have noticed a lot of the data, um, especially in a lot of the original um, services, it was actually stored in S3. Um, and effectively what we would do, so in, in the case of that, um, that service, that product service that Eric was um, alluding to, effectively because we stored um, the, the, the transaction history of the sources, we could effectively rebuild that on the fly. So it was, it was literally just a matter of, you know, pick the file up, drop it back in again. Um, or, or even um, we even set up endpoints um, in the service to, to do that internally. So it would actually automate that process for you. Um, effectively, what would then happen as, as we progress, we, we realized, you know, where we didn't need those, those um, that history, we could actually just store snapshots of the data and pull it out as we need it. So in terms of that recovery process, it was effectively, again, you know, just pick the file up, drop it, and, and the whole thing would, would trigger again. Um, yeah, I think uh, Eric's got a follow up too. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to mention actually that uh, we never mutated any of the records in our services. We just created new versions. So that allowed us to also delete a version and go back to the previous if we needed to. So it basically had history as Nick said. Okay. Eric, a further question for you. In relation to the analytics, did you consider Redshift Spectrum, as you stated, at no data warehouse? Was there a business driver or technology driver that has assisted the decision? Uh, yes, we did look at uh, Redshift. We also looked at Snowflake or Snowball. Is that Snowflake? I can't remember Snowflake. Anyway, um, and the thing was, we already had our data in S3, so we, we sort of gave Athena a go first because it was the quickest way to do it. And one thing we probably didn't emphasize enough is that we're trying to do this with a, a, a business insight, and sometimes they need a solution very quickly, which meant that we had to go with what we could do quickly as well. Uh, and that was a very quick way to do it because really Amazon and uh, sorry Athena and um, Glue is not a lot of effort to get something very meaningful very quickly. Uh, I believe that over time they probably wouldn't be able to handle massive amounts of data, but it was good. It's a very good start. Great. Uh, yeah, Nick, a question for Nick. Uh, how do you orchestrate the infrastructure? Um, do you what, what do you use? And if so, how do you manage the changes to the code for the various surfaces alongside uh, alongside that config? Yeah. So um, in in terms of orchestrating the infra, um, yeah, it was all infrastructure as code um, driven by CloudFormation um, um, at that point. Um, and in terms of the actual service orchestration, so it was all uh, ECS based. Um, mainly just came down to cost and a lot of our services were quite simple. So, you know, they, they, were, they were quite small. All the containerized workloads were very manageable, small, you know, we didn't need anything too complicated. So it's sort of Kubernetes was was not, not really on our radar. Um, we did look at it, but it wasn't something that we were too interested in. Um, uh, but um, following on from that, a lot, of, we you, you, you probably noticed near the end there that a lot of we, there was very much a push for um, serverless-based um, workloads, so um, Lambda came into play, and that orchestration almost um, wasn't really a. I don't want to say it wasn't a consideration because obviously you know you want to design your infrastructure correctly, but it does take a lot of that onus away from um, the developer having to worry about it, um, and that also plays into it a little bit. But um, again, it was all built via um, infra's code, so you know it was it was quite easy to to, to deploy and orchestrate. Um, and it's something we continue with today. Thank you. 
Eric, uh, were there any temporal data considerations, example, late arrivals or dedupes, out of band data? The duplication, I don't think because the keys we used basically would become is S3 and, and S3, well, it looks like a file system, it's more like a join hash table. So as long as your key is meaningful, uh, a business key, like we didn't use UIDs, so we did use UIDs, didn't we? A bit of both. But as long as you use a key where you have a, a guaranteed way of getting the same key again, uh, you can replace it. So I don't think we had deduplication issues so much. Um, don't believe so. We had basically versions. So it wasn't really so much duplicates. We just, we just treated it as a new version. And some case, sometimes we would have exactly the same version twice because you got the same source coming in with the same data twice. And we didn't really care because it's just it was one, one extra record in the database, but it didn't harm. Yep. All right. Uh, we have quite a few questions still, but three minutes left, so I'll try my best to get through most of them. For Nick, interesting topic regarding image recognition. Did you have a backup process to validate the, the classification, or was it just is there an object detect object detected in this image? Yeah. Um, at at that point, it, it was more of a sort of experiment. Um, so we we didn't I didn't we didn't get that far into, I guess, um, the, the process around it. Um, it was more a sort of a proof of concept to say, hey, is this possible? Can we answer this question um, via you know, this data? Um, but if it, to, to answer your question, though, there, there would have been, effectively, we, we were thinking about using it as more of a flag. So it's like, hey, you know, recognition thinks there's a, a person in this image. Um, can you check it out? And obviously, there'd, there'd be you know, checks for the inverse as well. We'd, we'd, we'd want to make sure that you know, there, there was someone confirming um, this, this data. Um, so to, to answer your question, yes, there, there probably would have been. Um, but in terms of the solutioning, it never quite got to that you know, productionization step. Um, so it, there, there isn't anything or it, it, it's not in place at the moment. OK, well, thank you. Um, so there's another comment here. In Eric and Nicholas's presentation, it's clear that the team extracted value from the data. Could the presenters please share experience or learning on exchanging data with other systems, whether internal or partners? Yeah, uh, Kmart at the same time. So we, we, we consider ourselves as not part of Kmart in the beginning. It was sort of a separate organization almost. And they started uh, working on streaming from their internal systems. And they actually also did that through SNS SQS, especially SQS. So we hooked up to their uh, SNS topics to get data from them. Um, we also did this with external partners through S3. So we actually used S3 a lot as a mechanism here to share data. We just agreed on the data format, uh, say with, the, with our customer, the retail partners, and also with the logistics partner. We just agreed on the, on the file formats, and then we used S3 as a mechanism. So that was basically it's almost like an FTP, right? Because it's just writing and and reading from buckets. Yeah, I, right. I guess just. Uh, oh, sorry. Just to follow on from yeah, that, but, um, the the big the big thing as well is um, it's, it's opting for snapshots of the data as opposed to deltas as well it does make life a hell of a lot easier if you can ensure that that yeah the data that you're getting at that time is the up to date snapshot for that um, thing whatever it might be, um, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier instead of having to you know, oh, I'll compare it with this old version and merge it. And I mean, sometimes it's out of the question and you have to, and that's fine, but opting for that that snapshot first approach really does, does help with that. All right, thank you, Irwin. I still have uh, quite a few questions. We we'll, we'll, might follow that up later, but um, thank you all for you, all your great questions and thanks to the panel for answering with such great insight. Uh, we'll not be launching one last poll to obtain feedback in today's uh, in today's session. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. We hope you got uh, the insights you need to drive innovation within your business. We will send a recording of today's session in the next few business days. We look forward to seeing you at future events. So.